Welcome back. Everybody get everything done they needed to at uh, intermission? I hope so. Oh, I can't resist. Merry Christmas! Oh, that's even better than the first one. Before we get started with the second half, uh, there's a couple of special things we would like to do, and the uh, most important and most special was, is to bring out the commander and conductor of the band, Major Gary Sapp. The next thing we would like to do is uh, to bring out a gentleman that you met a little earlier. You know, we can't do performances like this without uh, help from sponsors. And the sponsors that have helped us out here in Warner Roberts over the years are, are the best in the whole world. Representing the AFA, I'd like to bring to the stage Dr. Dan Callahan. Don Smith, the president of the local AFA chapter, the most uh, productive uh, chapter of AFA in probably the whole nation. Um, <clears throat> it's been our pleasure with the uh, Air Force Association to be co-sponsored with the uh, Sun newspapers over these years and for these wonderful concerts. And we can't let these opportunities go by without uh, saying to the band and, and to the vice commander who's also with us tonight, how much we appreciate this in the middle Georgia area and all over the state of Georgia. And um, it, uh, I spoke yesterday about uh, confidence and professionalism and excellence, and I could reiterate that tonight because this band, when they play, certainly uh, uh, exemplify those words uh, to the fullest. So it is that on occasion, the Air Force Association has the opportunity through its local chapters and on a national level to make presentations to outstanding persons and parties and uh, this is no exception tonight. We want to make a presentation to the uh, Air Force uh, Reserve Band uh, coming from the national office in the form of a citation. And I'd like to read the, the uh, words on this citation. It's a beautiful plaque, as we will, uh, uh, you'll be able to see uh, very shortly. Um, <clears throat> Air Force Association citation awarded to the Band of the United States Air Force Reserve in recognition of its, its exemplary performance as an ambassador of goodwill in the many communities in which it performs and, and as a tremendous motivator of support for the United States Air Force. Dated September the 17th, 1990, signed by the National President of Air Force Association, Jack C. Price. And it's a great pleasure as the State President of Air Force Association to make this presentation to the leader of the band and the band itself. Sponsorship that AFA has shown the band, not only um, here tonight, but over the years in many locations. We need the sponsorship, and it's, uh, it's a joy for us to be able to have the opportunity to sponsor such a great organization as AFA. If I might take just a moment, since I've got the, uh, the microphone here, I'm accepting this um, on behalf of the band, but it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge to you that what a wonderful joy it is for me to be able to work with such an outstanding group of individual men and women. And so if you would help me show my appreciation to these marvelous people back here, round of applause. And we'd also like to show our appreciation to the sun, and we have a uh, uh, certificate here that I'd like to present. Mr. Tom Reed, please. <laughs> Sir, I'd like to just read this if I might. Um, let me get over here. It says to the Daily Sun, H. Thomas Reed, General Manager, and the Carl Vinson Chapter Air Force Association, with grateful appreciation for your efforts to ensure that our Christmas concerts of December 9 and 10, 1990, were so warmly received. And it's a uh, framed for a picture of Poem Pipe Flight by John Gillespie McGee. Once again, sir, thank you very much for your sponsorship. Let me take
take just a, a moment to extend season greetings to all of you. This is the 13th year that the Daily Sun has joined forces with the Air Force Association and this magnificent band to create what I think is one of Warner Robins greater traditions. Thank you very much. Now that we're through with all the adult stuff, I hope you uh, big kids in the audience would uh, indulge me just a second as I address the next introduction to the little guys in the audience. In just a few minutes, we're going to bring, that, bring out a gentleman who's going to tell you a story while the band plays behind him. But before we do that, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the story so you can listen for some things. It's about a little angel, a little boy angel, who had just a small problem fitting in up in heaven. Then one day, something happened that excited the little angel, and in fact, everyone in heaven. The baby Jesus was to be born. It was going to be the first Christmas. So the little angel carefully chose his gift, and he chose something that had given him joy in his youth. This gift so pleased God that he did something very special with it, so that everyone would know all about the gift of love from the littlest angel. He made the gift into the shining star of Bethlehem. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage the narrator for this evening, Staff Sergeant Dave Rickard and the Littlest Angel. chase after it. (laughs) 
yes, and it must be here recorded, that his wings were neither useful nor ornamental. All paradise held its breath when the littlest angel perched himself like a fledgling sparrow on the very edge of a gilded cloud and prepared to take off. He would teeter this way and that way. But after much coaxing and a few false starts, he would shut both of his eyes, hold his freckled nose, count up to 303, and hurl himself slowly into space. However, owing to the regrettable fact that he always forgot to move his wings, the littlest angel always fell, head over halo. It was also reported and never denied that when he was nervous, which was most of the time, he bit his wingtips. Now anyone can easily understand why the littlest angel would sooner or later have to be disciplined. And so, on an eternal day of an eternal month of the year, eternal, he was directed to present himself before an angel of the peace. The littlest angel combed his hair, dusted his wings, and scrambled into an almost clean room, and then with a heavy heart trudged his way to the place of judgment. He removed his halo and breathed heavily upon it. Then polished it on his robe and tiptoed in. The understanding angel looked down at the small culprit. So you're the one who's been making heaven so unheavenly, he chuckled. Come here, cherub, and tell me all about it. Suddenly, almost before he knew it, the littlest angel was perched on the lap of the understanding angel and was explaining how very difficult it is for a boy who suddenly finds himself an angel. Yes, he swung three times on the golden gates, but that was just for something to do. That was the whole trouble. There wasn't anything for a small angel to do, and he was very homesick. Oh, not that paradise wasn't beautiful, but the earth was beautiful too. Wasn't it created by God himself? Why, there were trees to climb and brooks to fish, caves to play at, pirate cheek, the swimming hole and sun and rain and dark and dawn and thick brown dust so warm and soft beneath your feet. The understanding angel smiled and in his eyes was a long forgotten memory of another small boy long ago. Then he asked the littlest angel, what would make him most happy in paradise? There's a box. I left it under my bed back home. If only I could have that, he whispered in his ear. The understanding angel nodded his head. You shall have it, he promised, and a fleet-winged heavenly messenger was instantly dispatched to bring the box to paradise. <laughs> Then it came to pass that Jesus, the Son of God, was to be born. And as the glorious tidings spread through paradise, all the angels rejoiced. The angels and archangels, the seraphim and cherubim, the gatekeeper, the wingmaker, yes, even the halo smith put aside their usual tasks to prepare their gifts for the blessed infant. All but the littlest angel. He sat down on the golden stairs and waited for inspiration. The time of the miracle was very close at hand when the littlest angel at last decided on his gift. Then, on that day of days, he proudly brought it from its hiding place behind a cloud and humbly, with downcast eyes, placed it before the throne of God. It was only a small, rough, unsightly box, but inside were all those wonderful things that even a child of God would treasure. A small, rough, unsightly box lying among all those other glorious gifts from all the angels of paradise. Gifts
gifts of such rare and breathless beauty that heaven and all of the universe were lighted by the mere reflection of their glory. And when the littlest angel saw this, he suddenly wished he might reclaim his shabby gift. It was ugly. It was worthless. Oh, if only he could hide it away from the sight of God before it was even noticed. But it was too late. The hand of God moved slowly over all the bright array of shining gifts, then paused, then dropped, and came to rest on the gift of the littlest angel. The littlest angel trembled as the box was opened, and there before the eyes of God and all his heavenly host was what he offered to the Christ child. And what was his gift to the blessed infant? Well, there was a butterfly with golden wings captured one bright summer day, a sky blue egg from a bird's nest, and two white stones found on a muddy riverbank where he and his friends had played like small brown beavers. At the bottom of the box was a limp, tooth-marked leather strap, once worn as a collar by his dog. The littlest angel wept hot, bitter tears, for now he knew that instead of honoring the Son of God, he had been most blasphemous. Why had he ever thought the box was so wonderful? Why had he dreamed that such utterly useless things would be loved by the blessed infant? In frantic terror, he turned to run and hide from the divine wrath of the Heavenly Father, but he stumbled and fell to the very foot of the Heavenly Throne. There was a dreadful silence in the celestial city. A silence complete and undisturbed, save for the heartbroken sobbing of the littlest angel. Then, suddenly, the voice of God, like divine music, rose and swelled through paradise, and the voice of God spoke, saying, Of all the gifts of all the angels, I find that this small box pleases me most. Its contents are of the earth and men, and my son is born to be king of both. These are the things my son, too, will know and love and cherish, and then leave behind him when his task is done. I accept this gift in the name of the child Jesus, born of Mary this night. sightly box of the littlest angel began to glow. The light became a radiant brilliance that blinded the eyes of all the angels. None but the littlest angel saw it rise from its place before the throne of God. And only he watched it shed its clear, white, beckoning light over a stable where a child There it shone on that night of miracles, and its light was reflected down the centuries deep in the heart of all mankind. Yet earthly eyes, blinded too by its splendor, could never know that the lowly gift of the littlest angel was what all men would call forever the shining star. Technology cannot be overlooked in today's American culture. 
The Air Force relies on technology to keep us one step ahead as the most formidable deterrent force in the world. And where would you and I be without our telephones and microwave ovens? Yesterday's prototypes have become today's necessities, and yet we still show a little reticence and even disdain when discussing technology around the holidays. But how many of us would still put candles on our, the boughs of our Christmas trees rather than mini lights? Or pull out the old Victrola in a 78 rather than pop a cassette into our Walkmans just to hear Bing Crosby sing White Christmas? So when technology is used as a tool rather than an end in itself, we seem to have no qualms incorporating it into even our most traditional holiday celebrations. That's what this next piece does. Arranger Chip Davis has gone so far as to use the original melodies and modes of some of these tunes, which may contain some unfamiliar notes to some of us, and he has scored them using techniques dating back to the early Renaissance. He's also taken a few familiar tunes and expanded them using contemporary rhythms and harmonies. And when you add to this the marvelous orchestration for wind ensemble and synthesizers by Tim Rube of the Air Force Band out at Offutt, uh, Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, you come up with something very special. Now you may have noticed a little movement behind me before, the, uh, before this next piece, and that's because we need a couple extra players to help us perform this. Vocalist, percussionist Kathy Stellmacher and uh, bagpiper clarinetist Connie Beckers are joining staff, uh, Sergeant Jim Driscoll behind the controls of their state-of-the-art synthesizers to help us perform a Mannheim Steamroller at Christmas.
This is something I've neglected to do now three performances in a row uh, when introducing our synthesizer players for the last piece. I neglected to introduce to you the gentleman responsible for the beautiful melody at the end there in Silent Night, performed on his WX-11 wind synthesizer, Technical Sergeant Jim Larimer. This is something that was just brought to my attention a few moments ago. Uh, if you've been comparing your program and counting heads in our trumpet section, yes, there we are one short in the program. Uh, the gentleman who uh, actually has been here for all three shows, so I guess he did show up, is uh, Staff Sergeant Joe Lombardo from our trumpet section. Joe? Another particularly American tradition or concept is if it's not broken, don't fix it. And that could well translate into if you have great material like Sandy Patty's Merry Christmas with Love and a performer like Staff Sergeant Kathy Stelmacher, you don't need a long introduction. Would you please welcome back Staff Sergeant Kathy Stelmacher.
you know, all night long, we've been touching on how we celebrate the season here in America in contrast to the rest of the world. But to bring things just even a little closer to home, here's an arrangement done just for Kathy to feature her very special talents by one of our own Afro bandsmen. So now a very personalized Santa Claus is coming to town. Sergeant Kathy Stelmacher. Yeah. Yeah. All day long, it seems like we've been uh, catching up with, uh, keeping up with some of the people up here on stage. Well, this part is nobody's fault. This is, uh, we've been a little short-handed in the last couple of months, and when we're trying to put together a program such as this, where we have some demanding orchestration to fill out. It's uh, time to go out and look for look for some uh, some help, and I'd like to acknowledge first the gentleman sitting back in the uh, trombone section that you know he doesn't have a shaving waiver. That's uh, he's allowed to do that considering he's a retired bandsman from here. Uh, Warner out on his own, Roger Dennison helping us out on trombone. even shorter notice uh, coming down and helping us out from the uh, cold, cold north. I'm sure he's happy to be down where it's a little bit warmer. From the band up in uh, Washington, D.C., Technical Sergeant Kirk Christensen in the trumpet section. He's the really tall one.
and some other special guest. Let's all do what Santa said and help us out with a settled sing-along. No oh, come on ye faithful. it up a little bit and really sing right out for joy to the world. chance to even get over the band. Deck the halls. Everybody knows this one. This is the fall of
sing the adults on that one, so let's all sing real strong together for our final number, Jingle Bells. You know, when we in the band look out from the stage tonight, we see a house full of very familiar faces. And we feel the love and support that you, our hometown audience, have, has always shown us. But we also notice a void. Those conspicuous by their absence are comrades and loved ones involved in Operation Desert Shield, who are at this very moment deployed in the defense of us, their fellow Americans. We would like nothing better than to raise our instruments for a chorus of I'll Be Home for Christmas and make it all come true, but we know that's impossible. So instead, we hope you will indulge us this departure from traditional Christmas programming. As Staff Sergeant Chris Hudson and the band send this next one out to those brave men, men and women so far away. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I'd thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't Get the men who died who gave that right to me and I'd proudly stand up next to you and defend us still today. But there ain't no doubt I love this man. God bless the USA. From the lake of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, from New York to L.A., where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say, hey. 